But as you get older, a lot of people aren't sprinting. Don't go sprint at 100% when you start. One of the first steps to comfortably be able to sprint close to 100% is truly strengthening your feet. I'll give people a secret. You want to train your feet, just train your calves. You're jogging at a 12-minute mile pace. Just see what it feels like to do a 10-minute mile pace. But I'm talking about for like one or two or maybe three seconds. We're trying to give you the baseline things. We want to give you, we're going to give you the things that are going to allow you to build the structure that can then handle sprints. A hill is a really great place to start. Another thing you can do is pull a sled. Don't think about this as a race. We don't want to go fast too fast. If you're thinking that you want to go faster, that's usually a bad spot to be in. Like going faster should actually happen naturally. At uh, McDonald's now they have Krispy Kreme. Wait, what? How fast? What, what do you mean? Yeah, at like, McDonald's they have Krispy Kreme. Like donuts? Yeah, Krispy Kreme donuts. And fat little <laughs> Al Roker. <laughs> I saw I saw this on the Today Show. <laughs> Fat little Al Roker, biggest smile on his face ever. He goes, they got to put that on it. They got to put an egg McMuffin yes. on that. Make that like the roll. And he was so happy and excited. And everybody just kind of looked at him with disgust. <laughs> but I knew what he was talking about. It's going to be done. Duh. Yeah. You can't control all the people all the time. I was like, this guy's a genius. How long ago was Krispy Kreme put at McDonald's? Just like a week ago, I think. Fuck, bro. Fucking, <laughs> this obesity shit's going to go from 65 to like 80%. Uh, I'm serious. I'm serious. It's like, yeah. uh, we're, we're, <laughs> well, if it's we're that, not doomed, but we're doomed. If it's re that readily available, right? If I was fucking still eating McDonald's and I feel like this makes me want to go get myself a biscuit, mm -hmm. sausage and egg, I'd fucking get a Krispy Kreme donut. Because Krispy Kreme donuts are fucking good. Did you delicious. know they're going to be hot all the time? Mm. Too? <laughs> no. <laughs> How long has it been since you guys have had a Krispy Kreme donut? It's been a while. It's been a long a time long since I had a donut. Time. Yeah. Comment below if you remember Krispy Kreme if you haven't had it in a while. They're so good. I'm sour. In, uh, there's people out there living their lives <laughs> I'm fucking salivating. eating these donuts in, in high we're not school. part of that <laughs> in high school we used to just get like really really baked and mm -hmm. then go to Krispy Kreme donuts <laughs> you smoked weed in high school? <laughs> yeah I didn't know that okay <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah Andrew and so that's I mean I lived in a pretty small boring town there's not much to do so we would you know smoke weed and then we would drive to Sacramento yeah to get Krispy Kreme donuts. I have mm. a question for you, just real quick. What would your young self, your young weed smoking Krispy Kreme donut traveling self say to you right now with your child? And <laughs> oh. What would you, what would you think? Would you think, I'm so boring? No, or, no, 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 no. Okay, no, okay. No. He, he would say, just like I thought. Oh, sick. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, didn't Good know shit. how it was going to happen, but uh -huh. yeah, that was always the goal anyways. So yeah. That's dope. Okay. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. I'm happy to hear that. And then also, yeah, I mean, probably some like, he would freak out if he knew I didn't drink at all. You, that would be weird for him yeah. to hear. You guys ever been to Tim Hortons? <laughs> <laughs> I've only driven by it. Yeah, that's uh, like uh, more like on the East Coast. Yeah. Oh, nah, but Burdick and I like rolled through there <laughs> back in the That's who I drove through. <laughs> yeah, back in the powerlifting days and uh, like literally rolled through there. <laughs> and uh, we ordered like sandwiches. It was like, I don't know, like one o'clock or something, like 1 p.m., you know? The middle of the day, and we order sandwiches. They're like, "Would you like guys like a dozen donuts with that?" <laughs> well, y'all were fat. Y'all were it's fucking huge. I know, but they didn't even see us. Oh, <laughs> it was just Ooh. a drive-through. I think they offered to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Dog, we have a problem, bro. That's, I know. That's that. There and it was like legal shit around. This, it was man. like a dollar or two. We're like, <laughs> yeah. Why'd you even ask? <laughs> I think if we so went you in, said yes, right? Yeah, oh yeah. I think if we went in, they wouldn't have asked. They would have been like, "Give these guys the extra donuts." Yeah, just make it quick. I remember one time at KFC, <laughs> they they asked us like, "Hey, like we're closing down like for the day. Do you guys want like a pot pie?" I'm like, I think that sounds disgusting, but sure. They gave us like twelve. Oh I was man! Like, oh my god! What am I so? So we started like dropping off at families' houses and stuff. But that's good yeah. because I would have eaten all that. No, when god, I was younger, I would have eaten all of that. That kind of stuff, same thing. It's like, that's your calories for the week. It's something like a pot pie, which you wouldn't think would be like that crazy. Oh yeah. It's a little circle full of calories. Well, today, if people want to learn about sprinting, mm. should they fucking eat this food? Because no. actually, you know, if people start sprinting, they're going to want to eat more of this type of shit. Or if people <laughs> shovel snow. I heard recently, if you shovel Ooh. snow for 90 minutes, guess how many calories you burn? 90 minutes of shoveling snow. I'll say, I'll say 1,100. Oh yeah, there you go. It's twelve hundred. Oh, Whoa! Really? Yeah. Oh wow, that's shoveling it's, is hard work. It's, it's fucking hard as shit. Yeah, huh. shit's heavy too. Depending on like where you're shoveling or what you're doing. But yeah, I heard that on uh, Joe Rogan the other day. I was like, <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm.
That's a good way to train a kid. If you have some, well, I mean, probably people in snow are probably having their kids do that anyway. So mm -hmm. did you shovel snow as a kid? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. I actually kind of find it to be fun, but it does kill your back. Even when you're a kid. <laughs> well, look at you now. <laughs> <laughs> probably happy about Get that. Get that manual labor in there. Yeah, today we're going to be talking about some sprinting. I've been getting into some faster running, I would say, and uh, I'm working on it. Feels good, um, and I'm just having a lot of fun with it. Feel it feels great. Some days uh, I'm able to push into it a little harder. I haven't had any setbacks. Feel really good. The only thing I could say is like uh, every once in a while my feet will get beat up. Every once in a while my feet will be like sore, or I'll forget. Um, which I haven't really had that happen with lifting. You know, it's like, no, you're standing <laughs> like, like when, like Wednesday comes around or something and I, and I did legs on Monday or something. I, you know, I, I, I'm not like, oh, I kind of forgot that I did legs. You know, I can feel it, but like with sprints, I sometimes uh, forget the accumulative effects. And it's been a long time since I really practiced much sprinting. Whereas when I was a kid and playing football and playing different sports, sprint probably a couple times every day, mm -hmm. and, you know, like maybe even a lot every day. Um, think of like all the drills and stuff we did in football. There's quite a bit of sprinting and then even just, uh, doing scrimmages and stuff. You would just, I mean, now I think, I think of like, I'll go out and do some sprints and I'll do like six to eight sprints. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, I, I just can't imagine that there was a football practice where I didn't do like 40 sprints plus like actual sprints at the end of practice. Yeah. You know, but it's like, it's just part of, uh, part of growing up and it's part of being like in a sport. As you get older, you get a lot of distance from that. A lot of people aren't sprinting. And so uh, the whole time that I've been running, I've been wanting to get more into sprinting, but I felt like I needed to build some sort of base. And so that's why I've just really taken my time getting into it. Let's quickly talk about the foot aspect thing, man, because like you're, you're totally right. You know, when you're doing stuff in the gym and you're lifting, um, even if you do like some walking and stuff, you're not going to feel that wear and tear on your feet. But when you start trying to implement... Uh, and I'm going to say right now, before anybody gets too excited, don't go sprint at 100% when you start. It's a, it's a recipe for disaster, especially if you haven't sprinted in a while. But when you do try running faster, and you, you when you do run faster, you're going to be on the balls of your feet, you're going to feel your feet are beat up. Mm -hmm. Your feet and ankles are going to feel it every few days. And I think that one of the first steps to building the capacity to, at some point, might be a year from now, might be two years from now, comfortably be able to sprint close to 100% is truly strengthening your feet. I think that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And what, what are some of the things that like you've done just to ease yourself into having stronger feet for sprinting? I think, you know, the simple stuff is like uh, appropriate shoes. You know, a lot of people know that we're fans of Vivo Barefoot. That's a great place to start. The Shama sandals are unmatched as well in terms of like, the flexibility of that shoe and you're going to actually feel the ground a little bit more. So getting some sort of barefoot shoe, I think is a really great start because I think when we talk about all these different things, we're trying to think about um, what is something that's going to have the biggest impact with the kind of the smallest, almost investment, mm -hmm. you know, okay. There's an investment of like purchasing the shoes. Right. Um, but that's not a huge deal. And then you just wear them yeah. and your feet actually literally get stronger just by wearing them walking in them and doing the normal activity that you do. And that's the way that here at the Power Project, we like to look at exercise in general is like, I don't really know if there's a, a great reason for you to really be super worried about a one hour workout. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can spread uh, your, um, your exercise kind of throughout the day. And just when you walk by a kettlebell that's in your living room, you can do some presses. Uh, when you uh, wake up first thing in the morning and go outside and, and do some jump rope in the sunlight, and kind of double down on some of these uh, things that you're doing. But when it comes to running and it comes to like, you know, strengthening the foot, I think the first place you start is with uh, just getting rid of your shoes and wearing barefoot shoes. So maybe in training, you train barefoot here and there. Um, if you have access to sand, the beach is amazing, mm. but that will absolutely annihilate your feet <laughs> at first. So you're going to have to, every step that you take, you got to be really cautious with it. And you have to think about how much of this have I done previously? Yeah. If you're just like, okay, I'm going to go in the sand and I'm going to start to try to sprint, which actually is a great place to learn how to sprint, especially in the soft sand, but you're going to completely wreck yourself. You're going to be so, <laughs> You'll so be mad tired. Mark after trying. Yeah, so tired and so dead. So you, you want to try to, I think it's important to build into stuff so that things don't feel so 
horrific afterwards. Are you saying it, barefoot shoes to sprint in? No. Yeah, so barefoot shoes to sprint in, that would be like next level. You know, that would be, you know, something that you would want to kind of ease yourself into. You'd want to walk in them for a while. You want to train in them for a while. Maybe some of the jumps that you do. Maybe, you know, you're doing some box jumps. Maybe you're jumping rope. Um, even with jumping rope, though, you still might want like a, and SEMA is usually on like a pad, right? I use, so I use the jump rope pad to save my rope because if I'm jump roping with that jump rope on concrete, that actually will kill the rope over time. But uh, I actually jump rope with either the Vivo Barefoot Modus shoe or the Primus Trail shoe. Um, has a little more cushion than maybe the regular ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the, the Primus Light has not much on the bottom. So doing some jump roping on that doesn't feel too great. But the Primus Trail and the, the uh, Modus um, those shoes have a little bit slightly thicker soles and jumping on them is nice. You'll still feel it. Like you'll, st it's still flat. Mm -hmm. You'll still feel the ground. Um, but those, those are really good. I was actually going to mention too, when it comes to strengthening the feet, when it, for, for sprinting, it, it's odd because the walking around and all of this, I would look at these, even though you're active, I'd look at them as passive modalities. Mm -hmm. The reason why is because you're always going to walk. But how can we make sure that all of the steps you're taking, everything that you're doing is going to be helping your feet get stronger for other activities? And even though you're always walking and it's active, it's a you're still doing something you'd always be doing, mm -hmm. right? So I almost look at using shoes, barefoot shoes, as like a passive benefit. Same thing with standing on these mats that we stand on mm -hmm. right now. Like you could pull yours up. Yeah. But um, there's probably other companies and we don't have a code for this, but this is, uh, I think the stoic mats from wild gym, wild gym. Um, we're standing on these every single podcast and our feet. Woo! Yeah. They probably, we never, we never clean them, but our feet are constantly <laughs> getting this, like huh. getting this texture and our feet are grabbing the aspects of the mat, which makes our toes move, which is helping like strengthen the toes and the, the, the tendon aspects of the feet. This is totally passive and we're getting that benefit while we're podcasting. So if you're at work sitting in a desk, um, you can definitely benefit from that. And one other thing I'll mention is go check out our podcast with Kador Ziani, uh, the seven mm -hmm. postures that he, he literally mm -hmm. went through his postures and his book on Amazon honestly isn't expensive. I honestly think you should go get it because he goes through a bunch of postures that if you're on the ground, he gets in his feet. Yeah. Like that guy's, his feet, oh, they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. His feet can fold like crazy. Yeah. He's pretty wild. I'll give people a secret to the feet. You want to train your feet, just train your calves. You know, doing any sort of oh, calf, yeah. any sort of calf work is footwork. Um, and look, people need better calves anyway, right? People need bigger calves. I used to train my calves quite a bit when I was younger. I just, I like to clown on people when they ask me about my calves because everyone gets so frustrated. I'm like, yeah, I never trained them. But when I was younger, I did train them. I did boxing. I did jump rope. You know, I did a lot of activities where um, you're using your calves. And some people don't end up getting uh, well-built calves from just, you uh, exercise or just the different things that they like. So you might want to try to go out of your way to do some calf exercises. But while you're doing those exercises, think about your foot more and think about like single, you know, single leg, single foot type movements where you're actually really flexing. And so uh, some of the movements that you've been doing in the gym, I really enjoy those. Um, you're just basically putting pressure on the toe mm -hmm. and you're trying to you know, uh, keep your foot in a certain position while you're on like, uh, what do we have that slant weck board. deck, right? Yeah. There's the weck deck is actually mm -hmm. amazing for it, but slant, slant, if you have a slant board or weck deck, those mm -hmm. are good. Yeah. And you're kind of like, uh, you're just going in all different directions on that slant board. That is super challenging and super hard. And you'll feel your foot just, uh, start to fatigue and get tired if pretty you, quickly. If you guys are, Oh, Andrew has Kador stuff yeah, pulled up right now. But this also like lo looking at the way he moves, this is all the stuff that you're going to learn in his book that's super easy to follow. It's got mm -hmm. a big picture, so someone like me can actually pay attention to it. But just looking at the way he moves, it's one, it's very fluid and it, it just, it looks really nice. But it's also like, I, don't, I feel pain relief just watching him move this way. And then when I actually move that way, it's just, it, it, it just, I don't know, it kind of makes everything line up and makes you feel way better. Like that right there, especially. Ooh, look that at how right he's there. sitting on his ankle. Yeah, and then he does it again on the other side. Bam. That and, feels great. And something he shared with us is that like he does this all day, every day. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting, that's an interesting thing to share with somebody that's like trying their journey for the first time, their fitness or nutrition. Uh, like just imagine some, you know, somebody's like, well, how often do I do this? Mm -hmm. All day, every day. How about that? You know, that sounds like so discouraging in a way, but again, it's microdosing. It's like, you're just doing little bits of it. And you're not trying to take on everything all at one time. Mm -hmm. You're implementing one thing at a time. 
the jump rope for Encima, it, it came uh, after you implemented a bunch of other stuff that you held on to for weeks, months, years. The flipping of the kettlebells and uh, me going from, you know, running to sprinting uh, to working on some jumping. All these things, they take time. They weren't all integrated all at one time. I wasn't like, hey, guys, like I'm done with powerlifting. I'm going to retire and I'm going to go into a 100 meter sprint competition next week. You know, I, I, there's there's going to be a, um, there needs to be a lot of regression before there's any uh, progress really. And so I started way, way back. I went out on the track with Graham and I tried to do some kind of faster work one day and I just, I got hurt. I think, I think it was Same actually- day? Yeah. Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't the same day. You yeah, got was, on another day. Yeah, Graham Andrew does it's both. Like correlation. Yeah. Barefoot sprinter. Yeah, thanks, Graham. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Great program. <laughs> I'm fucking around. It was my fault. It's Graham's fault. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I got hurt, and uh, you know, I think some of that was just. I think it was just almost like fatigue. Like we ran a couple times that day, and then we stopped for a little bit, and then I went to run again. And like, the frustrating thing about that is, I feel like I wasn't even going fast, but fast for me at the time was still super slow. Mm. And now I'm, I'm, I'm working into a position where I feel like I can, um, like flex isn't the right word because I know I shouldn't be so stiff when I run, but I feel like I can uh, almost go full blast. And I, I um, reserve myself to not really get into too much of that yet because I still feel like I'm not 100% ready for it. Um, but a great way to get yourself into some sprinting, we were talking a lot about building up the foot and stuff, I think is very, very simply is just maybe you have a watch, maybe you have your phone. There's a Nike Run Club app that's real easy to get. It's free. Um, there's many different ways you can do this. But if you can see like your split, if you can see like what your time is, how many minutes per, um, you know, uh, let's say it says that you're, you're jogging at a, a 12 minute mile pace. That's great. Maybe every once in a while you push a little bit and you just just see what it feels like to do a 10 minute mile pace. Mm. And I'm talking about for just a few seconds, like just mm. check that out for a couple seconds. Go, oh, okay. That still feels kind of slow to me. I think I could do better than that. And then just kind of see what you can do. Um, but I'm talking about for like one or two or maybe three seconds, like really, really small, like burst. Uh, and that's what I do on my phone. I, I sometimes will look at it and I'm like, oh, cool. I ran like a four minute mile. I said not running an actual four minute mile. I ran a four minute mile pace for like a second or two seconds. And that time is getting better and better. And so to me, that's been motivating on my watch. I also have, it shows you like your miles per hour. And that's kind of cool. Just be like, oh man, I fucking ran 15 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. That's kind of cool. So uh, there's different ways to measure it. But again, I think the best way to do it so you're not going to get hurt is to start out, you know, with some, uh, start out with some light and easy jogging and then just say, I'm just going to push maybe, uh, I don't know, another 10% beyond that. And then I'm going to rest and push another 10% beyond that. I'm going to rest and don't have it in your head that you're going to sprint as fast as you used to run. You're not comparing yourself to anybody else. You're not comparing yourself to your former self just going at the pace that you can handle right now. And if you do a surge where you start out slow and then you pick up speed uh, gradually, that is going to be a safe way as opposed to if you just start and you try to just all of a sudden take off, you could get hurt in the acceleration. And when you're also going to get hurt is after you've probably already been running for about 20 yards. So if you're trying to run like 40 yards or hundred yards, that's too far. That's like, that's way, that's like way too far for now. Over time, you can work your way into that. I'm talking about you just hitting the gas for maybe like 10 yards. Mm -hmm. That's it. One thing I want to you guys to mention, uh, I hope you guys are taking notes because the way that we're going to talk to you about this is building a cascade of different habits and practices into your day that's going to help you get better at sprinting. Um, the reason why I'm saying that is because a lot of time when you're going to, when you go watch videos, I'm like, oh, well, how to build a bigger bench or the exercises for a bigger bench, exercises to for, for sprinting, right? They'll give you three exercises or do this exercises without realizing that there are all these underlying factors that help these exercises 
become more beneficial to the individual who's doing them. If you see someone doing a fucking A skip and a B skip and all that type of stuff, but you don't even realize that they've been doing something for so long that their feet are strong enough to actually handle the stresses of sprinting. And then you try to do A skips and B skips and sprint. And then you have a stress fracture in your foot because your feet Mm. are weak. We're trying to give you the baseline things. We want to give you, we're going to give you the things that are going to allow you to build the structure that can then handle sprints. So that's why we're talking about all these basal level things. Because a few years ago, I know that I did, my feet weren't strong enough to handle the sprinting that I'm doing right now. And like Mark mentioned, if you go out there and you sprint too soon, you know, a few years ago, I think it was two years ago when we first met Graham and then he took us out to the field to sprint. I hadn't sprinted in forever, right? And since I was like a soccer player, I hadn't sprinted at that capacity, but I was just like, you know what? My body knows how to do this. I was really fast. Let me do that now in a 250 pound body that produces more force, Mm -hmm. right? And I fucking pulled Miami. That was my fault. That wasn't Graham's fault. But the thing is, is my new body wasn't ready for the force that I was about to put through it. So we're trying to give you the the, the, the capacities and the, the practices that you can implement daily, right? Slowly, right? So it doesn't get in the way of life. You're not having to spend too much time with this, but slowly so that over time, you are going to build a structure that's ready for the violence of sprinting. Yeah, watch the video. Uh, there, we have a video that uh, Insema and I did uh, on YouTube. You've got to want to check that out. We just did some sprints on a hill. Mm-hmm. And um, I think you were going maybe 80% or so, maybe. 70-80%, some, yeah. yeah. And you just you want to keep it. Um, you know, if you're if you're new to it, you might even want the percentage to be lower lower than that. But a hill is a really great place to start. Mm. Um, the hill is going to slow you down quite a bit. Again, something like soft sand is going to slow you down. The advantage of moving slower, um, and the same thing would happen in the pool. And we'll get to some of the exercises you can do in the pool as well. But anytime you just slow the exercise down, you're getting rid of some of the violence of it. Uh, you can even say like a hill is somehow getting rid of some of the gravity of it because every step that you take is a step not only further out in front of you, but it's higher up. Mm-hmm. So you're not, um, you know, if you're if you're landing flat on the ground, your foot impact is going to be a little a little more harsh. And so there's a lot of things you can do to kind of mitigate. Another thing you can do is pull a sled. Um, and you don't have to necessarily even really run with a sled. Just walking with a sled would be a great start. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, you can try to like run just a bit with the sled, but really lightweight, like maybe just like a 45. I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of sprinters utilize that. But again, to Ensema's point, it's usually more of an advanced move. Like let's worry about sprints with weights after we already learned how to sprint. However, um, pushing into the tank or or pulling a sled uh, with some intensity can be something that could also get you ready for sprinting. And one of the reasons why hills are so amazing is like, you, you, you think about the ramp. A hill is like uh, weight training for runners. That's what a hill is. Because when you take your next step, that next step being higher, you're now pushing off higher versus when you're on flat ground, you need better technique and the stride length of your foot, you're going to have a, a longer stride length. So if you're not ready for that stride length, that's one of the reasons why when people new to sprinting sprint on flat ground and they try to put all that force into the ground, they're more likely to pull their hamstring because their stride length is longer. So their hamstring uh, length ends up getting longer too. But a hill, it's a shorter burst. Like when you take that step on, like onto the, the next part of the hill, you're it's a shorter step and it's a step upwards. Yeah. So now you're actually recruiting more fast twitch muscle fibers when you're doing hills versus when you're doing flat ground sprints. So hills can help prepare you to do flat ground sprints later. But one thing is don't think about this shit as a race. Literally, mm-hmm. even though sprints are, we want to go fast. Mm-hmm. Yay. We don't want to go fast too fast. <laughs> you, <Yeah. laughs> you go fast too fast, you fuck yourself up, dog. <laughs> yeah. And if you're if you're thinking that you want to go faster, that's usually a bad spot to be in. Like going faster should actually happen naturally. Yeah. When when uh when you're out on a run and you go to hit the gas a little bit and you go, whoa. I moved way faster than last time and I wasn't even trying that hard. That's mm-hmm. what you're looking for. And that's what we're looking for with diet. That's what we're looking for with strength training. Wow, my squat went up and it seemed like I'm barely even doing anything. Like I don't, my knees don't hurt. My back doesn't hurt. Everything. That's when you know when you're doing something properly. And it's it's kind of hard to hit those markers like that. But if you just take your time and just understand that this is going to take you a while. And by a while, for some person that maybe has been out of – uh, sprinting for a while, maybe it only takes them like six weeks to get themselves back up to par to where they can 
run pretty fast. But for another person, it might take six months. And for another person, it might take six years. Like, that's just the way it is. You might have, like, if you're, if you're like our, our buddy Russell, you know, for him to have some of these goals that he's starting to have now, he's recognize, he's making, like, a bunch of short-term goals. He's like, I'd like to be able to do this. I'd like to be able to do that. And then he's making a bunch of long-term goals. And so a short-term goal was, um, we talked the other day about him deadlifting 365. He's working his body weight down. He wants to weigh 365 and deadlift 365. And I'm sure Russell is super strong. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we can go in there and like in three weeks, he can deadlift 365. Yeah. Four weeks. Like he could, he's just strong. He could figure it out. I saw him benching 225 the other day pretty easily. I haven't seen him bench in forever. Um, so he, but we're not going to rush it. Like I said, let's take like six months with this because you still are working on the weight loss and to simultaneously lose weight and get stronger at the same time is a kind of a complicated game. And so why get hurt? Why, why try to rush something? It's going to be amazing when he does it. He is going to do it. And it's going to be six months from now. For the month of April, you're going to receive 25% off all Vivo barefoot shoes. And Seema, can you tell us why these shoes are so great? For years on this podcast, we've been talking about the benefit of barefoot shoes. And these are the shoes I used to use back in like 2017, 2018, my old Metcons. They are flat, but they're not very wide and they're very stiff and they don't move. That's why we've been partnering with and we've been using Vivo barefoot shoes. These are the Modus Strength shoe because... Not only are they wide, I have wide ass feet and so do we here on the podcast, especially as our feet have gotten stronger, but they're flexible. So when you're doing certain movements, like let's say you're doing jumping or you're doing split squats or you're doing movements where your toes need to flex and move, your feet are able to do that and perform in this shoe, allowing them to get stronger over time. And obviously they're flexible. So your foot's allowed to be a foot. And when you're doing all types of exercise, your feet will get stronger, improving your ability to move. Andrew, how can they get their hands on these? Yes, and for the month of April, you're going to receive 25% off all of your Vivo Barefoot shoes. That is a limited time deal for the month of April only. So if you've been waiting for the perfect time to buy your Vivo Barefoot shoes, now is that time. Head over to vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject, enter the code for April, and receive 25% off your entire order. Link is in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Do you guys have different shoes for sprinting versus long distance running? Um, yeah, I'll say that when it comes for, to, to sprinting, I end up using the, uh, the super shoes that you actually, the first pair of super shoes I ever had was a gift from Mark. It was the ultra, what are they? They're, uh, yeah, they're called like, uh, shit. I lost the name of it. <laughs> if you go to ultra's website, okay, yeah. you'll see they're, they're, they're one of their carbon foot plate shoes. And I ended up buying another pair of those and I use those cause they are wider, but I use those specifically for sprinting because of the amount of force that I end up putting in my foot with sprinting. Over time, I'm going to slowly start working into using a slightly thinner sole shoe. Like I'll probably work into the, I've actually sprinted in the, um, they're the Vivo uh, Magna Forest Escape. So you can pull the Ultra ones up, but the Vivo Magna Forest Escapes are actually hiking shoes from Vivos, but they have a good, strong sole where it's flat that I actually, I've sprinted in those before too. And I actually like sprinting in those for flat, but they, they, they have a, they have a good strong sole so that when I put force into it, I'm not feeling all of that ground impact. But these are the Ultra shoes that I use, I believe. Yeah. These are the ones I use for sprinting right now. Those are sick. Yeah. It's actually interesting. Like, you know, I, Another another good idea is to go to a track. I just happen to hate going to a track. But Me too. <laughs> I, just don't, I just don't like it. I mean, I hate it. It just seems like way too much of a workout. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and and that and that circle of the track, it's way too far and everything. It's just and then like running around in the circle just doesn't seem like a great idea. <laughs> so I just don't enjoy it. But going to a track can be super beneficial and running in the grass. If you have an opportunity to run on a field, that could be really big. A hundred percent. That's a that's a great opportunity, and and then you don't have to worry about your shoes as much. I mean, you can even start to work on stuff barefoot. And if you do stuff barefoot, and you're new to it, your feet are going to sort of dictate how much activity and how fast you're going to because you're. It's kind of like not feel good, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're running and the grass is like kind of dry or there's <laughs> like any discomfort. You know you're you're going to probably move a little slower than normal. So you'll have some precaution built in. And be okay with moving slow in the grass. If you go, you start running in grass, you're, especially if it's a slightly thicker grass, you're going to feel like you're running slow, right? That's fucking okay. Your feet, if you, if you do more stuff in grass, your feet will slowly also get stronger too mm. with it. So just, just be mindful because there's, there's, the grass has some give. 
unless you're on a like super hard dirt, but a lot of grass you have has some give. So it's going to be nice to do drills, jumps and stuff like that in the grass. That's a great idea. You, uh, you've been swimming a bunch lately. Oh yeah. 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 Well, How's that going? I guess I'll, I'll talk about that here. I don't, I wouldn't say that this is like for sprinting, but it's swimming has kind of been my secret weapon. And I actually not wanted to talk about that, <laughs> oh, whoops. but no, it's, it's okay. Well, you know what? My competitors aren't listening to this. And if they are, you're not going to find a pool. But um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, after we had um, Alan, Alan Belcher. Belcher. Yeah. Good thing I remembered. Alan's a homie. But after we had Alan Belcher come on the podcast, he was like, you know, um, John Jones has been using this with the pool and he's been like, he's been fucking loving it. And Alan started using the pool and he was like, yo, it's actually been a super good conditioning tool. I was like, fuck, okay. So he's like, okay, grab some, go buy some flippers. So I got some, some flippers. Uh, and I also got some, some stuff for my hands, which I don't use much now, but I still use them. But uh, I slowly started implementing freestyle work into what I do. And the thing I noticed with the pool is I won't go too long on this, but the big thing it does is I can pretty much hit the pool every morning. I hit it this morning too, and I hit 22 laps. Um, and that was a recovery swim for me now. Whereas in the beginning, doing one 25 meter back and forth or just one 25 meter destroyed me. I think the first time I hit the pool, I only did like eight laps and I was like, I had a super pump and I was super fatigued. Whoa. Now I can get in the pool almost every single day do a minimum 20 laps, it doesn't beat my body up at all. My body actually feels better coming out of the pool than when I went into the pool because what I've realized is when you're doing a freestyle, the 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 water is slightly giving you traction. Kind of like mm -hmm. how we talked about kettle flow juggling and the rope gives your body traction. When you drive down the pool and you're doing that and you're reaching and you're driving, I get this traction that happens with my hands. So it slightly pulls things apart when I'm kicking, right? It'll do the same with the hips where it kind of gives you a little bit of traction while you're swimming. So when I come out of the pool, mm. my body feels decompressed, but my breathing is the challenge. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the breathing that gets yeah. challenged when you're in the Brutal. pool. So I'm able to train my cardiovascular capacity without stressing out my body. Mm -hmm almost every single day. And as I become more efficient with my form, I can then push the cardio aspect of it without beating up my body. So I could do pull work and jujitsu right. and lifting on the same day, but the pull work isn't taking away from anything. It's, it's putting some stress on the cardiovascular right. system, but the body's okay. I think a cool aspect of being in a pool is that you could, you know, when I, th when I think of sprinting, you know, when I first started to think about sprinting, I'm like, what can I sprint? Like <laughs> I, I don't really possess the ability to go and, and run as fast as I can without getting hurt. Um, like, but I could do it with my arms. I could move my arms really fast. I could punch a heavy bag or I could do certain things like that. Even that, you know, you still want to be cautious because you, uh, you could hurt your hand. There's just a lot of things that you want to be cautious with. And I like how Ensema pointed to flippers right away. For mm. some reason, like we don't want to go, we don't want to search low enough a lot of times. We don't want to start low enough or slow enough and we really need to. And for a lot of people that are getting into running, like the first shoe that was recommended to me was the Nike Alpha Fly, which is a super shoe. Yeah. And then other people would be like, well, why would you start there? Wouldn't you want like, wouldn't you want to like do the work on your own? It's like, no, <laughs> I, I want, I want assistance. I want yeah. a lot of help, like, because I'm new and because this is like, you know, there's a lot of weight that's going to be super jarring on me. And for you or for someone new to swimming, man, that's a lot of work for your shoulders. And you said you had a pump. Like, you're not supposed to get a pump from swimming. I was super pumped. <laughs> you're just sitting there like, oh. <laughs> the first week, my whole upper body was filled with blood. It yeah. was insane. I still get a pump now, but. Yeah, there you go. There's the kind of the first shoe that I went with. Let me tell you a funny story about swimming real quick, which happened the other day of Sunday. I'll be quick with this one, guys. But. <laughs> I went in the pool and there's this guy swimming two lanes down. Okay. And he was just, he was cruising. No flippers, by the way, just cruising back and forth, back and forth. So I started doing my thing. And then I realized like, oh, he's trying to stay ahead of me. <laughs> I have flippers on. By the way, let me, let me tell, kind of give you the idea of the physique behind this man. Probably late forties, early fifties. He, ha he has some man boobies, no disrespect. He has a belly, but this man is a fucking dolphin. He's, he's going back and forth. He's going back and forth. So I'm like, this was the day I did the PR of 40 something laps. Oh, no wonder. <laughs> no wonder I did the PR, right? So I was like, oh shit, he's not stopping. So I wasn't stopping either. So we did like, and then I finally, after like 20 something laps, I stopped. And then after I stopped, 
He did two more laps and then he, and then he stopped. I was like, I knew it. I knew it. He wanted to beat me, <laughs> but he beat me and I had flippers on. So the thing is, what I'm saying here is like, no, I am not a fucking swimmer. But the flippers, oh my, like, oh my God, the flippers make being able to progress at swimming because my form in swimming is actually much better now. I'm not going to say I'm a pro swimmer or anything, but I got some fucking water legs. But even so, right. I think it's what I thought was pretty cool about that is he didn't look in shape which kind of kind of backs up what I think about swimming. It's not going to be the craziest thing for the body. And I know diet matters too, mm -hmm. but his cardiovascular capacity, that guy has a healthy fucking heart. Yeah. He has a healthy fucking heart, even though he physically looks out of shape. There's so many great things to a lot of these other activities <laughs> that people get into. And that's why we recommend that people do a sport, you know, try to find something, sometimes a sport because you're competing, you know, it could just be like softball or whatever, but or, or pickleball, sometimes because you're competing, the risk of injury is higher. But hopefully you're uh, invested enough in what you're doing that it'll that you start to think of what are some other things I can do uh, in addition to this so that I can, because I love doing this, mm. what are some things I can do in addition to this to make this better? And I think that, you know, having a, something like swimming, something like jujitsu, something like running, you know, when I'm in here lifting, I, I'm oftentimes thinking about, what, you know, how I want this to work out for running. So, so that could be, sometimes that might mean I do more work and other times it might mean I do less work. Like how many, uh, single leg, leg curls do I want to do? If I know that I'm going to run a lot tomorrow, like I want to do some, you know, like let's get some activation, the hamstrings. Let's, uh, let's still do some of these exercises that you love and that you enjoy, but there's no reason for me to do like six sets of 10 like that, that that's what I used to maybe do build hypertrophy and make sure that the hamstrings aren't a weakness on deadlifts and stuff like that. But there's no reason for me to do that now that I'm running because I'll go out and run. And I'll be like, holy shit, man. And then the whole week and maybe even the next week, I mean, it's a great way to get hurt is to start to combine, you know, too much of too many things going on at one time. But having a sport will knock out so many of the things that we talk about here. Like, how do you swim? Like you swim barefoot. Sometimes maybe you have a flipper on or something like that, but your feet have to work a lot. How do you do jujitsu? You do it barefoot on the ground, right? And you do, well, it's fighting without punches. I didn't, I, I did not tell Andrew pointed it out. I was like, Oh my God, well, what an embarrassing sport. I had to break down the rules. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, wow. That really changes. It doesn't sound that scary anymore, but I don't know. You guys make a big deal of it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so uh, I wanted to ask, uh, hopefully not to sidetrack the whole conversation about like the, about the feet. So my, my son will walk around everywhere barefoot. Like if he, we put shoes on him, he freaking hates it, which is great. I, I like encourage it. I take his shoes off, but he will run around on cement, like full speed. You can just hear his feet slapping, boom, 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 like That's hard. Good. Right. It is. It's great. And I was just thinking like, dude, if that was me, like, man, I'd, my feet would be hurting really bad. So, um, what, what do you guys have for people as far as like recovering the feet? Like if your if your foot hurts, like mm. what can you do? I know we were talking about like stepping on those, uh, stoic mats and doing these things passively. Oddly enough, but, I think the stoic mat. If but yeah, I was going to say like, yeah, what yeah. if you are already kind of like, Ooh, like I went too hard. I wore the wrong shoes. I did it in cement, not grass, like you said. Like, what are some things that they can do to help kind of rejuvenate their feet? I think some walking would be a good idea. I, I don't I don't always think that uh, stretching is always a good idea when something like kind of hurts. However, I have found that stretching the top of your foot, just taking your foot and like putting the uh, top of your toes down and like stretching that, that portion of your foot out. Um, just feels good. I'll just like sit like that sometimes. Like uh, you were showing Kador, I obviously can't sit on my ankle the way that he does. But just having that pressure uh, on the foot seems to help a lot. I think uh, a lot of times the uh, the things that you have going on in your foot sometimes come from upstream. Sometimes they come from tightness of the calves, like the way that you're landing in particular. So we're huge fans of that roller that uh, Encima has right there. You can roll that on your shins and calves. That thing's super aggressive. But it, mm. it, it works amazingly well. And actually, people that have like plantar fasciitis and some things like that going on, plantar fasciitis, uh, by the way, I think people think that that's like in the middle of your foot. It's actually more towards your heel. You'll just have like crazy heel pain all the time. You're like, what's this? That's welcome to plantar fasciitis. That's what that is. And uh, you can get rid of that 
most often by working through the shin and the calf. So um, that would be some of my recommendation would be to do some like almost like myofascial release stuff on that. And then also just using your head and your training sessions. Like what are some things, you know, I don't know, your feet are beat up. You try to think of things that uh, maybe you, maybe you're on a bike instead of out for a run. That's why uh, triathletes are actually, triathletes are injured usually a lot less than like marathon runners. And it's because they have other things to work on uh, that prevent them from doing any one thing way too much. They usually don't swim that often, but getting in a pool is a, is almost like a form of recovery in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and getting on a bike, obviously like biking, they say that biking can be the most grueling thing that anyone could ever do. I've never tried it to that degree, but um, biking can be a relief from being like on your feet. So, uh, you know, hopping on a bike, getting in a pool, cold plunge is amazing. Like I use my cold plunge every single day without fail. And, but it's not always me submerging my whole body in there every single day. I just will at the very least get my lower leg in there because that makes my legs recover. Boom. Just like instantly, or at least it feels that way. Yeah. Cold is an amazing recovery tool. Um, I know like, you know, when I was, one of the big reasons I built the skill of jump roping was to strengthen my feet. And I understood that by getting better at jump rope, it's going to have a cascade effect where it helps my feet get stronger, which is going to make sprinting feel easier, which is going to make me feel more fluid in jujitsu. So one thing that happened though, is I was increasing my jumps, increasing my, um, you know, my frequency of doing it per day is my ankles would start getting beat up because the, the, the volume of jumping. So like sometimes if you start feeling something's beating you up, maybe you'd bit more, a little bit more than you could chew one day, just don't do it the next day. <laughs> I, I know some, I know we talk about microdosing and ideal, the, the goal is to be able to do a little bit of something every day. But there were some days that I just didn't jump rope because like, I was like, oh shit, my ankle is, uh, my ankle's not feeling it right now. So there was like some days where I just didn't jump and maybe okay, the next day I'd try to jump a bit. I'd feel a little bit of it. I'd jump for a little bit. And then for that day, it'll only be a minute or two of jumping. And then the next day, it'll only be a minute or two of jumping. But the next day, I'm like, oh, okay, boom, my bounce is back. Okay, let me, I can push it again because it's recovered, it's gotten stronger, and I can move forward. Another thing that's helped get rid of a lot of general pain, ankle, et cetera, is going back to, I don't know if, if you can pull up the YouTube video we did with Power Plus on Super Training 06 when he was here. Because I, I want them to be able to see that slant board thing that he showed us. That's mm-hmm. why I started doing it. There's this thing that he had us do on the slant board uh, where you're putting your foot on it straight on, you're putting your foot on the slant board and your, your foot's facing one direction, then your foot's facing another direction. But that actually helped strengthen my ankles because when you're putting your foot on the slant board, ideally, I'm also holding, when I'm doing it here, I'm not doing it on that day, we didn't hold anything in our hand. When I do it, I'm putting something in my other hand to help me balance. But my goal is to like get onto my toes, right? Feel my calf flex, but I'm also spreading out my toes on the slant board, right? So that I feel like when you spread, when you spread your toes and go up on your pinky toe, or like, let's say this, put your foot on the ground right now, if you're listening, go up into like a, like you're, you're, you know, getting, flexing your calves. Now really try to spread your toes as you're up on your feet. If you spread your pinky toe and you're not just up on your big toe, but you're also up on your pinky toe, you'll feel mm. more activation yeah. through the ankles. Or if right? you try to like lift your pinky toe up, <laughs> it feels it, like it, death on the big toe. <laughs> it, it, exactly. But you want to try to spread your toes and have all of yeah. your have all of your weight planted there. When I started to do that, I started to feel that area that I always got pain in my ankle. I started triggering that. I was like, oh, so an aspect of that is because my like my ability to like have dexterity and spread my pinky toe is weak. So then there's, there's this, there's this like pain traveling up to the ankle. This helped me fix that balance, helped improve my dexterity. And I haven't had any of those ankle issues then Mm -hmm. since then, but I figured out it was because of that. So this right here, I remember Mark, when you did this, when we were doing this here, you said the next day that you felt a lot of soreness in your feet, right? Yeah, for sure. This kills your feet initially, Mm -hmm. but if you add this drill into your day, and again, you can have have your hand on something so you can balance, you're going to find that your feet are going to get a, your feet are going to get a lot stronger in time. There's absolutely no reason why you can't just do this whenever, wherever. Yeah. I do this shit at the airport. I'm waiting in line (laughs) and I'm like, oh, fuck all these people. I'm going to, I'm going to get mine. I'm going to get some training in and I'll just, I'll just do it. And, And it, you know, I don't think anyone knows or cares. Like you can barely tell. And rather than like, you know, 
making a scene and like trying to be up on one foot and having the other leg up high, I'll just kick stand the other foot back just so I have a little bit of extra balance. Exactly. Or sometimes I'll just stand there. And I mean, you guys see me moving around on the podcast. I'll do calf raises and stuff. Uh, I know we're maniacs of this stuff, but like, it's just fun. It's fun to be able to like uh, find some things that work, find some tangible things that uh, help you to feel good when you're doing some of these movements because going out and sprinting, like it does cost you a lot. And it is something that can break your body down. Your body needs to be super strong and resilient. It, it, real, real quick on that on that little portion where you said, you know, because I've seen comments of people being like, oh, your, your life is centered around this. That's why it's so easy for you. Or like, oh, wow. Because I made this video about jujitsu and I outlined like some things that you have to do to make sure your body's ready for jujitsu. And there were multiple comments that said like, oh, so you're saying that you have to, how your whole life has to revolve around jujitsu so you can do jujitsu for a long time. And the thing is, is like, I, I get like, we all have different things we like to do, but you are walking around all day long in this bag mm -hmm. of tissue. Mm -hmm. And the habits we're talking about is just stress testing this bag of tissue so that day by day, this bag continues to improve. Because if you're not stress testing it, if you're just like, okay, the only time I'm going to do anything for this hmm. bag of tissue is when I go into that gym for 60 minutes, and then the rest of the day, I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want and not think about how it's functioning. <laughs> then when you're in pain, you can't fucking whine about it because you're not taking the time to take care of yourself. We're not giving you a whole fucking workout to do. We're just giving you concepts to try to add into your And that day. goes for anybody too. It doesn't matter even what you're doing in, in the gym. You could be doing all the correct movements in the gym. You could be doing yoga. You could be doing Pilates. You could be doing things that you think are really going to be beneficial and they're really going to save you and have you feel better. But if you still have crappy habits outside of the gym, you're, you're not going to really, maybe you'll get something from it. Like maybe it'll be helpful, but you're not going to really squeeze everything out of it. And I think that that's what we're talking about. Like a lot of times on this show, we're talking about how do we get the most out of these things? Yeah. And I, I again, I know I, I might be biased because like this, these are things that I think about. But when I think about us talking about these things, I am thinking about the person who's in the office. We're thinking about that person who has to sit at work all day. And the thing we're thinking is like, if you're at work, you can be passively doing these things, or you can take three minutes to the slant board that's on the right of your office desk and do something real quick. You you can do that. It's not impossible for you. And I think it's it, 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 it would be a disservice to yourself to think that you know, you can't do that because it's not, you don't need a gym for a lot of the stuff we're feel, talking about. Make you feel good. Yeah. Shit makes you feel good. Yeah. Um, moving on to like, you know, we were talking a little bit about like some other exercises you can do to kind of prep yourself. I think there's like just old school movements and old school exercises. I, you know, high knees come to mind, like these drills that you may have done in football. Um, you know, maybe uh, kind of like, I don't even know what they would call it, but just like a side like, what's it, what's it when you run sideways? What do they call that? Yeah, just lateral. It's like a lateral run. Yeah, like a lateral run. Like some of these things that maybe haven't practiced in a while. We call them karaoke's when you're going like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When you twist yeah. the legs around and that's uh -huh. that kind of thing. Mm. Two in, two out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that kind of stuff. I mean, it's great. It's great for balance, coordination. Obviously, you got things like uh, walking backwards or running backwards. These are all like little preparatory things that you can do. Um to get yourself, you know, kind of prepared to sprint. Obviously, jumping. Jumping's huge. So some form of jumping. And Seema has been real big on the jump rope lately. I've been messing with it as well. Um, jumping, you know, you don't always have to jump up onto something. I think that's kind of like all we can think of when we think about jumping. Um, and a lot of times people will try to jump up onto something high and jump mm -hmm. up onto something higher and higher. Mm -hmm. And, uh, while that may have some utility, I, I don't think that's the smartest way to do it. I, I think literally you could jump onto the same height most of the time and, and be fine. Should be something you can clear very easily. There's no reason to kind of get hurt uh, mm -hmm. doing some of these things. But I think what's important to be in recognition of whether we're talking about sprinting, lifting, or jumping the people that do those things with the most efficiency and the most proficiency and they're like bouncy and explosive with the movements, those people practice with uh, things that are really easy for them. Um, there's a couple people, a couple of dunk people on uh, Instagram and you watch them work on their jumps and they're like, just hop up onto something that's six inches, hop up onto something that's like eight inches. They, they'll bounce down and they'll, but they have this really good, uh, kind of rhythm to them as they're like jumping down and jumping onto other things. It's not necessarily about them uh, jumping onto something that's, you know, 
five feet tall or something. It's more about them um, building up that elasticity in those uh, shorter movements and getting their feet off the ground quickly. Mm -hmm. And so and when you're just starting your journey, I wouldn't even really worry about getting your feet off the ground quickly. I would just, just try some jumps, jump up and jump down from some stuff and make sure you can kind of do so safely. Um, I guess it would be a mistake too, if we didn't mention like, for me, I have, you know, decades of lifting behind me. And so I think that's really helped uh, make me resilient oh, yeah. to all the different things that I've been doing recently. And then another thing that allows me to be resilient is that I don't really push it that crazy. I don't have, I'm not competing. I don't have like a real particular precise goal um, at the moment. And so therefore I don't feel like I have to do this program. I don't feel like I have to do these times. And that's another um, situation where when you start to do those things, they have a lot of reward to them, um, but the uh, the risk is certainly higher when you are accountable to compete in something. I'm going to say this. Strength training is huge, and there's a lot of things that you can do in the gym that are going to improve your ability to sprint. But you got to look at sprinting not like I'm about to race the homies and be the fastest in here. I'm about to go on a race. You need to be thinking about sprinting as like, I just want the capacity to sprint. Um, that's the same thing I, the way I look at sprinting. And not sprinting, the way I look at swimming, because swimming is just, I want the skill of swimming proficiently, not at any type of pro level because of the benefit it brings my body. Um, in terms of strength training, I'm not trying to be a professional powerlifter. I want the capacity to lift mm -hmm. weights, to strengthen my body. And for me, the big capacity is a grappler. All of these things feed into that. But for you, the big capacity may be being able to fucking run with your grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> and your capacity to sprint, and it doesn't need to be sprinting at 100%, but to go kind of fast without even thinking about it, it's just something you can do where you can just bolt to 60% with Forget your fucking- how fun that is. Right? Yeah. Right? Just soup, 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 right? You, that is what we're looking for here. So when you're building up this skill of sprinting, don't think of the sprint like, I want to be Usain Bolt and go on the track and sprint 100 meters. This is a long game play where a year from now or two years from now, you're able to go into a 70% run without even thinking about it. Because mm -hmm. your body, you're just so chill with it. It's just something you're able to do. It's not something you need to think about. You don't need to worry about doing a 100% sprint because none of us are track athletes. <laughs> but most of us have lost the ability to sprint, right? That's So that's what you got. That's how you got to think about it. Yeah, and we'll end up bringing on some guests uh, coming up, talking about sprints and functional patterns. They talk all the time about so everything you're doing, you know, trying to be related to gait and stuff like that. So that'll be kind of cool to get some uh, commentary from those guys, uh, as well as some other people that we're going to get on that uh, can talk about sprinting. I know you were saying that um, you had a friend that gave you some uh, good critique on your running and it was just kind of move your arms a little bit more, like, I guess, move your arms back more. Yeah. If Andrew pulls the video up on um, Mark's page, the one where we were sprinting mm -hmm. together, my friend Micah, who was a UC Davis, I think he was the captain of the track team when he was there. He watched my sprinting and he was like, oh, you're leaking power in your arms. I was like, all right, tell me what's up. Tell me what's up. And I, I love this dude. I appreciate him looking at it. But if you watch my arms, when you see this next part, look at my arm swing. Right. If you see, like, my arm doesn't come all the way back and it doesn't, I'm, I don't have that gait. And when I was sprinting, when I was younger, I was a soccer player. So my thing, like, uh, if you ever watch Cristiano Ronaldo, Ronaldo sprint, it bastardizes sprinting, but that man is very fast on the field. So what Micah fixed and what he told me to do was to start, like, trying to improve my arm strength. So what I've actually been doing is I, I actually have the WEC shakers. They're in the gym. I could show it right here, but, um, I'm, I'll show you real quick. What I do now is I, you, you can literally do this drill at home, but I'd suggest that if you try this, be kind to yourself because you may have never moved your elbows to this type of flexion. Your shoulders might not be able to handle it. But literally all I do is this when standing. <laughs> and I try to be as relaxed as possible. Like you see, I'm not like, I'm not straining. I'm not using muscle to move my hands into those positions. You burn a ton of calories doing that, by the way. I'm just getting my elbows mm -hmm. back. I'm getting my, right? And and I'm going to start like implementing that into my sprint is going to help me. And I've actually done that since it propelled me forward faster, right? So um, yeah, that's one thing. If you, if you're, if you are arm, if you're not using your arms, you are leaking power in your sprint. Your arms can help propel you forward. They move in tandem with your legs. Right. So they're not, they're not something that I was using much. So 
it's yeah. hard, you know, like we're, we're not, you know, we're not like proficient at sprinting or at least, you know, for me, for sure, I'm not proficient at sprinting. And so it's going to take a while. Right. But then on top of that, it's like, you start thinking of like one or two or three things. And, uh, because I'm not proficient at sprinting, um, you forget a couple of them, you know, like you, you shouldn't have to think about sprinting. Right. That's what people will say. You know, like a lot of times, like even the comment section, like you're trying to teach like way too many things. It's like, well, no, you, you, there's there's certain things that you you need to cue yourself in some way because you're going to be messing up somewhere when you're not good at it. And so I'm sure the same thing happens in jujitsu. The same thing happens with powerlifting. You know, your foot's supposed to be, you know, facing this way and you're supposed to force your knees out, you know, and keep your <laughs> and keep your chest up and <laughs> get your air and push on your belt. And like there's there's so many different details of that, that when you're new, you're trying to focus on too many things and you, you don't really have the capacity to just squat. And so for now, for me, I don't have the capacity to just sprint and have it, uh, have it be like the way that I want it to be, I guess. You and your leaders had an awesome night. You got dinner or you just came back from the gym and it's time for that fun time. But you look down at your willy and well, it's not working the way it should. Where's that blood flow? Well, that's where Joy Mode comes in. And I can read you these ingredients right off the bat because they're all natural ingredients, L-citrulline, arginine nitrate, panax ginseng root, and vitamin C. The thing about Joy Mode is you just slip this baby into a little bit of water, drink it in 45 minutes later, when you're getting ready to go to the pound town, you will be ready to rock. And you know what I mean by rock. Joy Mode's really awesome because there's a lot of things that people promote as far as sexual wellness tools, but there's a lot of weird ingredients in there. These are all natural ingredients that's going to help your own production of blood flow. Stick it in some water. 60 minutes later, you're going to be able to stick it into something else. Joy Mode's your way to go. Andrew, how can they get it? <laughs> yes, that's over at usejoymode.com slash power project. And at checkout, enter promo code power project to save 20% off your entire order. Again, usejoymode.com slash power project, promo code power project, links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. There's a guy I want you to see if you can pull up Andrew. His name is Ashton. Can just type in. Oh, yeah, he's a monster. Let's type like Ashton Black on YouTube to see if he pops up. Ashton Bodybuilder. Because we need to pull up one of his sprinting videos. Oh, yeah. Ashton Hall. Put him, pull him up tank. on Instagram. So y'all like, because I'm pretty sure Ashton, Ashton was a sprinter when he was younger. Um, then he put on a bunch of muscle. But the the form is still there. Yeah, he's huge too. He, yeah, he's huge. So I'm pulling this up to show like you can be a big motherfucker and, and, and be able to sprint. Um, and just pull up one of his sprinting videos. If you scroll down, keep scrolling, keep scrolling. Right there. That one with the glasses on. This one? Oh, Either or. Oh, that's a picture. Go to yeah. slow-mo. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Look at how his arms move. You know what I mean? Dude. That, it, it, the thing is, is his <laughs> sprint passes the look test. You know what I mean? <laughs> Funny enough, functional patterns use this in one of their videos um, to show how it actually, you know, like if you just work on movement, uh, you, you, your sprinting will improve. But the thing is, is like this guy sprints and he lifts. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know why you're using him. It's not like he did functional patterns to get this big. Dude, he looks like if you <laughs> used uh, AI to create like Yo. the strongest, fastest man in the world. <laughs> give me the strongest, fastest black guy in the world. <laughs> Ashton is what pops up. <laughs> but it passes the look test. You know what I mean? That's why they ended up using it as a good sprinting clip. Because Dude. you could see how he's opening his body up, but I think one of the cool things when I look about when I look at this is some people are going to be like, "Oh, you, what, you're talking about sprinting. You're not even a fucking track coach. Sprinting is movement, man. Right? It's it's a it's a human movement mm -hmm. that at some point we were all able to do without really thinking about it. Relative speed. Some people yeah. were faster than others, but when we were kids, at some point we were able to sprint. And then through lifestyle or just certain practices, we locked our bodies up to a point that we can no longer express this movement ability. This is just a movement ability. That's all it fucking is. And props to the people that film this, Dude, by the way, because yes. they do a great job. Dude, what the That's fuck? That's all I could think about right, right? there. Like, we got to oh get gosh. Ashton out here, bro. We got to get Ashton out Yeah, I've out talked here. to him a little bit before. But the, the way that his hips move is, is interesting because a lot of times a bigger guy, the hips won't really move like that. You can kind of like almost see... I think it was Muscle Doc who talked a lot about disassociation. Uh huh. Um, this guy would be able to swing a golf club, I'm sure. Like he might not be great at golf, but like he would be able to swing a baseball bat. You know Hell what I yeah. mean? 
Whereas yeah. like a lot of other times, you know, I know for myself, like me swinging a golf club is like not, not, not a great idea because okay. I can't kind of disassociate the way that he's doing. <laughs> There's a comment that's like childish Gambino it's in the comment section. Do you see that, Mark? What does it say? In the comment section, it's, it's Donald right Glover right oh, there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is amazing. And everyone's different too. Like, you know, I, I'm sure like a sprint coach might have criticism of this, but like you got to move the way that your body moves. And it looks like he's pretty fucking built up top. And so his arm swing might be out a little wider than someone who's, you know, than, than maybe when he was younger and mm -hmm. maybe when he was thinner, you know? Yeah. I, I know he's grimacing, but like the way his body's moving right there at the beginning, it looks pretty effortlessly. Like, yeah. It looks like it's almost nothing for him. Well, I think, you know, a guy like this, they develop such a great strength to weight ratio, you know, that they, they, they just get used to moving their body around. It's no surprise, you know, he can crank out pull-ups really easily. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if like, you know, he just hit the ground and pop out a hundred push-ups real easy. You know, like a lot of times the strength to weight ratio of people that sprint is really high. And you see like on that first clip, it did a really good job. It's shown a lot of internal and external rotation of his hips, which is like, it's just hard to do as a bigger guy, you know, like if you watch um, like Terrell Owens or you watch uh, Randy Moss, these, you know, uh, NFL football players, a lot of times they're bringing their knee in uh, kind of through the midline of their body, almost like they're trying to knee themselves in the balls. Mm -hmm. um, and it's rare to see that from a bigger guy because your thighs are literally in the way of each other. And he actually is kind of like, He's still doing it. His his leg is still having that whip uh, that you want to have. There's still a lot of internal and external rotation. But yeah, because he's so big, it definitely, um, even though he's still moving tremendously fast, it's definitely still slowing him down. You know, if he, he probably like when he was younger, he, I would imagine he's faster. But yeah. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. But again, like, does he have, does he, does he have the capacity to sprint? Yeah. hundred percent. And one of the things- He's doing what's fun. Yeah. And, and one of the things I think is so cool, Andrew, you mentioned his face grimacing. He has the ability to put all that force through his body and feel comfortable doing it. So he can then push the intensity to the point where his face starts to, like he starts to express because he's still comfortable putting that through his body. Right now, I got to, the way I sprint- I need to keep it. I need to keep nasal breathing. I'll, I'll, I'll exhale through the mouth here and there, but I need to keep my face calm because if I go too fast, I'm still not comfortable at my top speed. Mm -hmm. I'm not comfortable keeping my body relaxed at my top speed. Like you mentioned, his body. You, you mentioned you mentioned something funny. You said his body still looks relaxed even though his face is. Uh, mm -hmm. You're right. His body is like, yeah, don't get like, when I say relax, I don't mean there's no places that have tension. Like he's keeping his core stable, you know, his, his hips are stable, but he's able to produce that force and have it go through his body smoothly. There's no, there's no, there's no place within his sprint that's stopping his force output. Whereas some people may have a hip issue. Mm. So when they sprint, it's kind of jerky. I know we've seen some videos of that, or some people like myself, I wasn't taking a stride. So that, that, that lack an arm stride was actually messing with my power, you know? So that's why one of the things I think is super important when it comes to sprinting is when you start sprinting, make sure that you, you're, you can, you can actually relax when you're sprinting. If you start speeding up and you're like, you're thinking and you're like, Ooh, this feels uncomfortable. Slow the fuck down, yeah. slow yeah. the fuck down. You're not ready for that speed. Go at a speed where like you can breathe, you can go kind of fast. You can maybe let your body stride, but you still feel good. And then over time, slowly increase that speed where you can stay relaxed. When I say relax with quotes, but stay at that speed. Because if you go too fast, that's where you fuck yourself up. It sounds a lot like jujitsu. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so he was using something that I wanted to ask you guys about, but like in regards to trying to build up capacity for sprinting and just making sure you're able to stay calm. But, you know, using something like a skier because you're not really moving mm -hmm. and you can really burn yourself out there. But is it this the right type of stimulus when trying to build up a capacity for sprinting? I think something like a skier or a rower or airdyne bike. Um, I think all those things are great because I think you can normally go pretty hard on those things. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was mentioning earlier. It's like, what can you sprint on? Can, can at, at the moment, the only thing that you can sprint, you know, at 90% on is an elliptical, then that's great. That's a good, that's a good place to start. Um, over time, hopefully then you can sprint on a ski erg. Hopefully over time you can sprint on it. You just have to realize like, if you haven't put a hundred percent output into anything, this is, this is also too, um, 
mainly for people that have already built up some capacity with strength. Like, if you're not strong, you can probably bypass almost everything we said today. <laughs> and, and you probably go out and sprint and be totally fine. Mm. Because it's it's the build up, building up of strength that actually leaves you quite vulnerable. Uh, because I think you can kind of just like blow out your engine in, in some sense. But again, if, if you haven't been, if you sprinted when you were younger and it's been a long time since you've done any sort of sprint or it's been a long time since you exerted like a ton of force into something, just take your time with it, whether it's the bike, whether it's the uh, elliptical or whether it's a skier, no matter what it is, tell yourself, this is day one, week one. Okay, I saw the watts were there. They were at like 300 and they were there for a second. Next time I come in, I want to see if I could hold that 300 watts for like three seconds. And then time after that, maybe I go to 330, you know, and then you progressively you take your time. Hopefully, you know your body a little bit by now and you can um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, make it more difficult and make it more challenging over time. Yeah, the, I, I would say this. The flat ground sprint is like the the king of the sprinting capacity. It's also the most dangerous of all of those because the instrument that you're putting power through is your body. Because now if you're on a salt bike, a skier, mm -hmm. a bike, um, you are putting 100% through that instrument in its fixed range of motion. You know what I mean? If you're sprinting on an assault bike, it's just circles, <laughs> right? <laughs> circles and, and, and arms, right? And you can put as much force as you want in that. It's going to be kind of hard to injure yourself, right? Same thing with the rowing machine, although maybe you might injure yourself a little bit on the pool if it's too much resistance. But you're just, that, that instrument, you can do 100% through that instrument. But when you're on the ground sprinting with your body and your instrument, which is your body, isn't ready for the force, mm -hmm. that's how you blow your shit out. And that's why all the things we're talking about are trying to strengthen your body's structure and strengthen your ability to move through those range of motion so that now when you're putting the power through the structure, it's able to handle that power from input to output smoothly. And when it's not, that's when you fuck yourself up. I uh, remember asking uh, Chris Bumstead about a dunk that he did oh, on Instagram. I and I was like, how is that landing? He's like, awful. <laughs> He's like, that, that's going to hurt for a while. So sometimes it's, it's the, you know, like you can do certain things, but again, if it's been a long time since you've done them, you want to just think about it a little bit more. I'm sure that almost everybody listening can probably jump as high as they can and, and probably not have any problem, but Again, why do that on day one out of nowhere? Like, well, why not just just take your time with it? Maybe uh, you sit down in a chair or sit down on, on a box and just jump and just say, I just want my feet to come off the ground. And then maybe you try to jump a little higher and just see how that feels. And then again, say that's week one. Maybe you did 15 jumps. It's like, that's good. Move on to something else. And you want to you want to kind of just continue to bring these things in. And for me, it's been like so much fun because now I can go into the gym and I have, um, I just have so many different tools. Sometimes it's almost overwhelming. It kind of reminds me sometimes of like when I first started lifting, when I first started to like gain knowledge, I was like, I want to do that, but I don't want to do that that way because <laughs> of the information I have about that particular thing. And now I don't think that way anymore. Um, because I've learned so much that some things have kind of come full circle, but there's so many different things to do. There's sandbags, there's kettlebells, there's dumbbells, there's, you know, regular weights. And there's the things that I enjoy. Like I still will just bench press because I've always liked the exercise. Mm. It's easy. It's an easy exercise for me to do that I'm already proficient at. So why in the hell would I get rid of it? Mm. The things that you enjoy, the things that you like, they're super important and they're important to your overall health as well. It's not really talked about much with longevity, but um, I would even go as far to say, like if you enjoy having a drink here and there, that I think that that's important to your longevity. I'm not talking about like getting fucking hammered. <laughs> I'm not talking about like, you know, uh, being irresponsible with certain things, but there's things in this life that if you enjoy them, and you can enjoy them and not be like addicted to them and other things like that. And it's, there's not a lot of negative to them. You should fucking let yourself enjoy them. So the different movements and the different exercises that you've always liked, I think you owe it to yourself to kind of keep some of those things around here and there. Pass me that kratom to you real quick. I'm gonna take a quick <laughs> Speaking of. No, you said that. But it's funny you said that, you know, like, I mean, obviously I have been drinking coffee much, but I, I drink, I'll every now and then I'll have a little bit if I want a little bit of a kick. And mm -hmm. I like that I don't need it every day, but I can pull on it when I want it. Right. And it's just like 
have a little bit, feel it, let it go. I know. So, so it's like, we talked about getting rid of caffeine, but it's one of those things. Am I too weak? To- <laughs> Why? <laughs> what the fuck? I use lotion. I'm not this weak. See? Okay. It's because I had That's lotion so on my funny. fucking hand. No, I know. Some I of think those Mark, are... you were looking at me, you were like, and see, are you really questioning some everything? Are... <laughs> no, some of those are screwed on tight. I, so I wanted to make sure it wasn't just me. So if he's got a problem with it, I'm like, okay. Oh, shit. But hey, one thing I don't want you guys to sleep on is um, your core training for sprinting. Because one thing that happens to a lot of people is you'll watch their hips and they're sprinting with a little bit of pelvic tilt. And that can fuck with your lower mm. back. That's like not, that's just not a safe way to sprint. You want your hips to kind of almost be in a slightly, slightly neutral-ish position. And you want your core to be able to be strong. You don't want an open core while you're sprinting. Yeah, not too arched. Exactly. So I think actually one of the things that could be beneficial are heavy carries. Heavy carries in general. Mm. Because if you're doing, if you have a barbell and you're doing like a Zercher heavy carry, you're going to notice you're not going to do that Zercher heavy carry here. You're going to do it here. If you have access to sandbags, fucking hell. If you have access to sandbags, a good light sandbag, you could put on your shoulder, you could put it in front of you. But what you're going to notice is again, you're going to fix that pelvic tilt. You're going to, you're going to, your core is going to be in the right position, whether it's on your shoulder or here. You're going to stabilize. And when you walk, you're now training yourself through gait while keeping a neutral, uh, a neutral spine, good hip and core position. And you're strengthening all of that in motion. So heavy carries in general, fucking grab yourself some dumbbells, heavy dumbbells, fucking walk, right? That can be super beneficial for sprinting. I think uh, we have some heavy med balls and stuff like that in the gym too. And they're Mm -hmm. like, some are like 40 pounds and 60 pounds. Like they're not insanely heavy, but because of like the circumference of that thing, you know, you're carrying it way out here and you have to kind of like adjust your body around it. I think that if you get into weights that are um, like real heavy, then you're going to kind of be walking, like leaning back and it's going to kind of defeat the purpose of some of what you were talking about. So Mm -hmm. Still make sure that you are able to kind of lock it in. One of the things I think that's really cool with in it, with a sandbag in particular is the way that you have to like, you have to like hug it. You have to flex your biceps and your pecs and stuff, which is something that you don't ever really think about flexing when you're like, if you pick up a box off the ground. Yeah. But I think it's something you should consider. I think when you do pick a box up off the ground, I think you should kind of almost like, um, uh, cable crossover the, the damn compress thing. Compress that bitch. Yeah, yeah. Compress that thing a little bit, flex the pecs a little bit and and tighten up the core as you're as you're lifting. I think it will help. And so I think the sandbag is something that can kind of and some of those other implements that are like that for carrying, I think are really great to keep you connected to those weights. Is there anybody that should avoid sprinting? I'm thinking not uh, uh, not, not about like like injuries or anything like that, but like I don't know, should power lifters avoid sprinting? Should you know, bodybuilders avoid sprinting. Like, is there anybody or any, you know, group of individuals that like, okay, yeah, you probably shouldn't be sprinting. Yeah. I think it's great for everybody. And the longer that you can do it, probably the better. I mean, there's guys in their seventies and eighties sprinting. Um, Josh Bryant is a huge fan of sprints, Mm -hmm. huge fan of explosive work. And that guy can haul ass. I saw him like sprinting up a hill the other day and he was like, flying you know he he looks uh looks incredible with it so i think it's i think it's for everybody i think it's overlooked i think it's hard and i think it's just overlooked (laughs) (laughs) i love this video Uh uh-oh i this is good old kevin hart yeah don't don't play the sound don't oh you want sound yeah don't sprint against i don't think there's music yeah don't sprint against a uh also World-class athlete. What time? What are, what, what are they doing? <laughs> They're getting ready. Uh, he sprints against like a former NFL running back. No, it was a uh, Riddler. Um. Oh, there is music. All right. Just fucking mute that shit. My bad, dog. Edit here. <laughs> no, you're fine. All right. And... So Jer- Jeremy Riddler. So we're watching Kevin Hart sprint, but in this sprint, it's apparently been a long time since he sprinted. Ah, ah, ah. He <laughs> tore the bottom. He tore his adductor, the bottom of his abdomen. He totally like fucked that up too. He tore a bunch of things and he was wheelchair bound. <laughs> Look at his face. He's like, oh! <laughs> yeah, he was wheelchair bound for a few weeks. Now, guys, you know, I, I don't want to laugh at this. Oh, look at that video. The first one. I think yeah. that first one has some interesting audio, but pause this real quick. Um, <laughs> The the thing I reason I pulled that up is Kevin Hart did marathons before this. You remember mm-hmm. he he's done marathons. Yeah. He's a guy who loves to run, so it's not like he was unfamiliar with running. So the, what I, what I'm saying is, 
even if you're familiar with running, even if you've been running for a while, that doesn't mean you should spin out 100% capacity because he was racing somebody. Mm -hmm. This is the danger of racing. <laughs> when you're like, I got to beat this person. I'm going to put all the power through my mm -hmm. body. And he apparently had so much power that he tore through tissue. Damn. He tore through tissue. <laughs> so, when, Andrew, you mentioned who, who do I think is ready for sprint? Who, who's sprinting not for? I don't think sprinting is not for everybody. I, I think we all have the capacity. It's all how fast you get yourself there. The steps you take to move towards that capacity. If you're trying to speed run your ability to sprint, that's where you fuck yourself up. Because mm -hmm. if you got some pain in your hip and pain here, that doesn't mean you'll never be able to sprint. Right. That just means there are things that you need to work through before you get yourself to sprinting. Right. Um, but that can be an end goal because when you're able to sprint, that means you have you have a you have the, all that ability in your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think people just need to just be really cautious with it. Yeah. You know, go out and do like a hundred, but like, I don't know, give yourself 30 seconds to finish it. <laughs> like seriously, give yourself like a long ass time to finish it. And then maybe you like if you were to do it on a track, you you run and maybe you do 30 seconds and then you walk the the turns. And then you can, you know, run again and just, you're going to have to take your time getting into this because uh, you will get hurt. And it's like not, it's not worth it to blow something out uh, to get hurt like that. I mean, we're trying to do some of these things uh, to better ourselves, not to set ourselves backwards a bunch. So um, in my experience, it's been nice just to really just take my time with it. And I haven't gotten hurt except for that one time where I was trying to push a little beyond where, where I should have. I just wasn't, I wasn't ready to do that. The day that I, I pulled my hamstring running with you guys, we weren't racing, but like yeah. we were running next to each other. And I was like, <laughs> I'm going to go fast. Yeah. <laughs> I was racing. Yeah, yeah. So you see, like, don't fucking race. Yeah, I was trying not to look at anybody else. I'm like, yeah, keep my head down. <laughs> Yo, oh my God. Oh, on the note of what you also said, though, um, in terms of taking your time, when you're doing some of these workouts, if you're one of those people who, you know, you can actually, you can start going kind of fast. Go kind of fast, <laughs> but on your rest periods, rest, walk. Don't, don't, don't try to use your rest periods as like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to run a little bit and then I'm going to sprint rest so that on your next sprint, and I know we're saying sprint, but technically you're not going as fast as possible, but on your next sprint, you can put a good amount of effort into it because if you don't give yourself the rest you need in those rest periods, if you're like doing a little bit too much and then you go into that next interval, a little bit fatigued. That's not what we're trying to get out of it. You know, we're trying to actually put a little bit of intensity into this. And if your rest periods aren't fruitful enough that you're not able to recover, then you're not actually going to be able to put in the intensity that you want to put in on your sprints. So now the sprints you're doing aren't as beneficial mm -hmm. because you're not giving yourself the, the rest time you need. So fucking chill out when you're resting. You can walk, you can jog a little bit, but don't, don't try to have really... You know, don't don't waste your rest intervals is what I'm saying here. And should people, when they go to sprint, should it be, there's the start line. All right, I'm going to sprint from here to there. Go. So they go from zero to sprint. No, I think, you should, I think uh, you're better off just calling all this stuff surges. Mm -hmm. uh, so that way you just start out moving um, something beyond a walk, like a little bit of a jog, and then just pick up going faster than whatever you were doing. Um, I don't know why this has always made sense to me, uh, but I've done this with everything. I did it with deadlifts. I did it with bench press. Uh, to set up for those lifts, I would always think to myself, okay, this would be the worst position to lift from. And then I would orient myself from there. I'd situate myself from there. Okay, my back's rounded. I'm dra draped over the bar. I have absolutely no shot of like pulling this kind of weight off the ground in this position. And then I would kind of get my shoulders into place, my lats into place. And I did the same thing on the uh, on the bench press. And when I'm thinking about running, I think about how slow can I run? Like, let's make that a competition. I want to see how, like, do something that represents a jog to other people where they would say, you're no longer walking, you're jogging. It's clear. <laughs> do something that's a little bit more than a walk. And then from there, you can start to mess around with different speeds. And you can start to see how, you know, how, how you can go a little faster. But for me, I always like to use the term surge. And that just kind of means you're going from one speed, which means you're already in motion. You're going from three miles an hour to six miles an hour, or you're going from um, five miles an hour to eight miles an hour. I think that's a much safer bet. You're going to get probably more hurt. Um, it, it, it would be, it's kind of rare to hurt yourself in the acceleration phase, but it, it's just, it is dangerous. So 
that would be like the number two spot you're going to get hurt. The number one spot you're going to get hurt is if you're sprinting and you're running for more than about five seconds. That's where you're going to get hurt. Four or five seconds in is the same thing happened to Kevin Hart right there. It looks like they were running like, I don't know, 40, 50 yards. I don't know how far they were going, but after a few seconds is when your luck runs out because you're producing a tremendous amount of force. You're probably at like what they would consider to be like something like a peak force. And the amount of force that you're putting on one uh, on one leg is insane. It, it can't be matched in the gym. You can't replicate it in the gym. It's like, I don't know, six or eight times your body weight or something like that. And depending on the athlete, depending on how strong they are, they can do even more. So maybe your average person can put like six times their body weight, but maybe this guy over here can put like 10. That's like, Jesus, like that's a lot of horsepower. And you still have to get yourself used to that. And there's no amount of leg presses or lunges or squats or anything that's going to prepare you for that. You got to get prepared for it in a lot of the ways that we mentioned here today. I've never driven like a stick shift car, <laughs> but if, if I think about it, like I think it's, it's good to, when you start doing this, if you're new to it, if you've never sprinted before, then you're going to realize that you have different gears. And then as you do it more, you'll realize like, oh, wow, like you can really, you have like a gear one through gear 10, right? So when you're accelerating, slowly go through your gears. Like seriously, when you're accelerating on your sprint, go to gear zero, one, two, three. My peak gear is going to be probably gear seven or eight. That's, that's like, that's where I'm stopping. I'm not going to gear 10, gear 10. I'm, I fuck my, I will, I'm not going to say I will fuck myself up. I think I may handle gear 10. Mm -hmm. Okay. These days, but I'm still not going to do it for a long time, but take yourself like up a to, car. There's much no like a reason car. to go flying too crazy. You want to get arrested? <laughs> getting arrested in this segment is pulling your hamstring and tearing your ass up. That's fucking getting arrested. And yeah. I don't want to fucking get arrested. So I'm going to gear six, seven, and eight. Yep. That's where I stop. So just go through your gears gradually. Don't go from gear zero to six. You ain't ready for that. You ain't ready for zero to seven, zero to eight. You're ready from zero, one, two, three, four. Maybe a few years from now, you can go from zero to eight. Mm -hmm. But that's not what we're doing right now. We're babies. Yeah, it's called a uh, like a, a rolling start, right? Like, so yeah, instead of going from a stop sign and just fucking revving it and flooring it and taking off, you're talking about like getting into like second or third gear and then kind of getting on the gas, but not redlining that bitch to mm -hmm. where your engine blows or something crazy. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But um, for some people that need the structure, should they implement sprinting as like an accessory after a workout? I know we talked about like microdosing and that sort of thing. Or should it be its own separate thing, kind of like the way you're approaching swimming? You know, it's like you're not really, I, I don't know, maybe you are, but you're not doing like a kettlebell workout and then finishing with the swim. You're going to swim to start your day. Yeah. Should sprinting be its own thing or should it be something like, all right, cool, we're done with the lift. Let me go hit a hill real quick. For me, I like doing it like after my day has been like going for a while. Cause like to try to do that first thing in the morning seemed like it'd be, yeah, this wouldn't feel so great. So I'd rather do it like, I'd rather do it like after some training or something like that. Mm -hmm. That'd be crazy. Yeah, huh? it'd be hard, right? <laughs> Roll out of bed, cold yeah. plunge, and then sprint. Oh. Yeah, and just like run, run right into it. But I think it, you know, it's highly individual. Like some people, you know, they probably sometimes, you know, I've I've been out like on a run before, and I've seen like. I've been out super early on runs before, like five o'clock, six o'clock, and there's someone like just finishing up. So everyone's everyone's a little different with that. But I, I think getting in some activity and getting some movement in, um, I think is like super ideal. So a lot of times track athletes do a bunch of drills and they do a bunch of stuff on the track and then they kind of start their workout. I don't do anything before I start running um, ever. It doesn't really matter what kind of running it is. Um, the only thing that I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll jog and walk and I'll take my time. I might jump a little bit and move around a little bit that way. Um, but the only thing that I may do is I may actually do like a little bit of a workout. So I might do like some kettlebell swings, some overhead presses, some stuff with the spine, move around a little bit, you know, be in the gym for 20, 30 minutes and then maybe go run. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just highly dependent on the person, but Whatever the case is, the uh, more intense the activity that you're going to do, the more warm-up that you need. So you actually need more warm-up. You need way more warm-up to sprint, which should make sense. Um, but a sprint might, you know, and, and in this case, you might only be doing these kind of quick surges. 
that are only four or five seconds. And you might think, well, I don't really need to warm up much for that. But again, the intensity is going to be pretty high. And we're by no means saying you should go to 100%. We keep reiterating that you should probably be in like a 70 to 80% range would probably be a pretty reasonable place for most people to start. And when you're starting there, yes, you do need less warm up, but you still need some. Uh, if you're going to go on like a long run, like a lot of the stuff that I do, where I go like on like a five mile run, you literally, the, there's no intensity to it. So there's, in my opinion, there's no really real reason to warm up for it. Your warm up is just like starting slow and then. Yeah. Yeah. And just going in. Yeah. You know, we had our conversation with Joel Green and Joel loves to do these, uh, I think five times a day, he'll do a, just a, from cold, 20 second sprint. And Joel specifically said in his podcast that that is a young person's ability. And it's true. When you see kids, kids will be like, <laughs> out of fucking nowhere. They'll just like go, right? And the reason why Joel did that and the reason why he built up to that is so that he could keep that young body ability. Mm -hmm. So how can we do that? It's, I think, and, and the way I handle sprinting right now is I don't make it a crazy hard workout. You know, there's a little, there's a little like bike trail that has a, a little mini incline right by where I live. So I'll just take my running shoes, go out there. I'll warm up a little bit, do some high knees, do some lateral stuff. I'll do a, my, my first sprint surge, I'm going to call it a surge, is going to be like at 30%. I'll do like two 30%, then I'll do one at 40%, then I'll do one at 50, 60%. Then my remaining four or five are going to be at like a 70 to 80%. You know what I mean? I slowly ramped myself up to that. But when I get done with that, my body isn't beat up. I can come here and work out. I can go to jujitsu. It's not the only thing I do during the day. But the thing is, by doing that type of workout, I've been able to really improve my ability to sprint while not taking away from anything else I'm doing because it's not destroying my body. So I think you need to figure out an intensity that you can do where the next day you don't wake up, you're like, oh shit, <laughs> like your hamstrings and your knees and your feet are done. If you wake up the next day and that's how you feel, you've done too much and that's not something you can do consistently. So you need to be kind to yourself and you need to, I needed to humble myself and understand that these aren't going to look the way I'd want them to look. Mm -hmm. I want them to look intense. I want to feel like a badass. I want to feel fast. But initially, these aren't going to feel fast. But now, they can feel fast because it, none of them, they didn't cost me anything. Mm -hmm. So figure out a way to do this so it doesn't cost you much, but you're still making an inching progress, inching forward in terms of your progress. So how do you measure progress with sprinting? I think you can measure, I think you can measure it through like how, how much, how difficult it feels. Okay. Because initially when you start, it's going to feel difficult. The form is going to feel janky. Um, you're going to do feel that are kind of iffy where you're like, okay, I need to slow down. But as you continue, you're going to start being able to get to that same speed you were getting to last week. And it's not taking anything out of you. It's actually not even taking much mental stress from you to get to that speed. Right. And it might not be very fast, but last week getting there was a fucking chore. Then the week after that, getting to that speed again, it's like nothing. Actually, your warm up was very easy this time. That's how you measure progress. You there's so many things. Your fucking feet. Probably when mm -hmm. you start, like your feet might be feeling it. And then next week your feet are feeling it less. That's progress. Mm -hmm. Progress doesn't only need to be measured by um, how fast I'm going, but it's also how is my body handling the stress I'm giving it? Because over time you're going to be able to progress that stress and it's not going to take much out of you. That's a lot. You might also notice that you want to do more sets. So you might finish with like a 70 or 80% set. And maybe last week or the last couple of weeks, you called it right there. But now you're like, well, that actually seemed pretty good. Like I'm going to do a couple more. And that's where you really start to see a lot of progress. That's where you will actually start to get faster because now you have an accumulation of stuff that you've done. But I think a lot of what we're pointing to is like, we're so unfamiliar with practicing this at, at uh, the stage that we're at now, um, that any amount is a good amount. You know, so the sm even the smallest amount, even if you went out and you only did one sprint, that's one extra sprint that you didn't do last time. And so over time, you can kind of build upon that. Um, I, yeah, I've noticed definitely for myself that the, the call to like do a little bit more is a really good sign that like I'm recovering from it. Mm. Um, and that I am getting better. And then I also, I will look at measurements. I will look at, uh, my watch will track my speed, which I can see afterwards. And, you know, it will say you ran X miles per hour. Or if I have my phone with me, it will also tell me that. So there's a lot of apps that people can use and they can, there's also like Strava, which I think, I think it's called Strava. 
is like an app that you can use and it has like, you can sort of, this is like kind of counter to what we were talking about earlier, but you can kind of race people, which this is more for like longer distances. I don't think they have shorter distance stuff, but I think this is more for like longer distances and you can kind of see like, oh, someone ran the Arboretum in, you know, 30 minutes or whatever. You can kind of match yourself up against these other numbers, which I think uh, that's really cool. But you know, for some people, they really like the data. They really like the numbers a lot. I uh, I try to track a lot of stuff for a while, and I just I just realized that I'll I'll never care about it. I've, I've never <laughs> cared about data, and I and I just don't care. Um, but it is nice every once in a while to kind of see like, okay, that was faster than last time. Check out this video because Adriel Mays goes deep into how the kettlebell has been helping him build even more muscle than he currently has. This guy doesn't really do barbell movements, but he can do a split squat with 405 pounds. That's all I got to say. Kettlebells. Check it out.